Thank you so much that we can just tabernacle like this at Life for Store once again. Lord, I'm not just before your saints who've been faithful for a long time. I'm here with your beautiful new baptized members, Lord, who's one week old. It's more than a God-given privilege, Lord, and I pray in the name of Jesus that your sweet holy angels will come and surround us like a wall of fire and protect us from the powers of God. We pray for thy sweet Holy Spirit that he will move upon the hearts, Lord. I know the message that I have, what you gave me this week to, to, to present to your people today, Lord. I pray they'll be able to digest it Amen. in such a way that it will become a part of their lives. Oh, loving Lord, please don't let go of us. We need thee so much. Amen. Thank you for the songs and Thank you for all the readings, and Lord, we just leave ourselves in your holy hands now, praying always that the power of the living God would abide with us this day. So bless us, Lord, and keep us, and I pray your message will go forward like a bullet this morning. Amen. And that many hearts will realize the need to get right with God before it's ever too late. And we just want to tell you that we love you, because this is our prayer. And our praise with divine thanks in Jesus' name that everybody say. Oh, happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath. Chew me up on this, brother. The reason why I chose this mic because you told me it's the better one. <laughs> I missed you this week. Ah, now you're getting there. I missed you this week. Did you miss me? Yes. Did you have a good week this yeah. week? Did you put back on the television? <laughs> How was your Wednesday, life food day? I know some of you couldn't wait to start eating back the type of food you was eating, but praise God, I know some of us allowed Wednesday to continue to be a special day. Now, this is good, brother. I can just take my time. But I miss you this week. It's good to see you this Sabbath. May God bless you. I pray that the message the Lord has placed upon my heart, you would receive it. You know, you know when I get asked to speak, I usually get asked to speak in places where I haven't been for a long time or I haven't been before. But being asked to speak to a group of people who I've spoken to for two weeks, one has to ask the question of what? What should I speak about? I can preach about heaven is worth it and make you feel so good, but then when you leave the doors, all it is is just a feel good factor. I can preach about hellfire and the judgment of God. But I don't want you to love the Lord because you're scared of him. Yeah. I could talk about the condition of the church so the new baptized members could be aware of the problems which will be facing them. But I'm sure they're learning to find all that out. So the Holy Ghost told me to speak on a subject which I don't need prayer to present it because I want to make sure I present it right. I want to make sure I present it right. And the message is entitled, The Seat of the Spirit. The Seat of the Spirit. It is known as the electrochemical computer of the human anatomy. In an adult, it weighs approximately three pounds. It is protected by 28 pieces of bone and is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. It has four main parts 
On the top part is called the cerebrum, which deals with our thoughts. On the bottom part is called the cerebellum, which deals with movements. On the left hemisphere, it deals with speech and reading and writing and logical thinking. On the right hemisphere, it deals with creativity, artistic ability and emotion. It has a hundred billion nerve cells transmitting information at 450 feet per second. It also has a hundred thousand miles of blood vessels in this area alone, enough to go four times around the world. It is estimated that at least 70,000 thoughts are contracted through this organ every single day. It is known as the human brain. Listen, it has three main lobes. It's got the temporal lobe at the base of the brain, which deals with hearing and smelling and vision. It's got the parietal lobe, which deals with the back of the brain, which deals with touch and taste. But then it's got the frontal lobe, right there, directly behind the forehead, which deals with the power to think articulately and it is different from every single animal on this planet. And the largest and the most complex part of the brain is the cerebrum. The cerebrum composes 85% of the brain's weight and the frontal lobe is in the cerebrum. But it is here where it's the seat of the Holy Ghost. God did never ever want mankind to ever know what sin was. Wasn't in his plan when he made man. It was not. God's plan for us to know the difference between good and evil. The human physiology, physiological makeup and the psychological makeup was not designed to deal with evil. Our makeup, our brain was to delicately put together to be exposed to sin. Listen, listen, listen. Yes, we were made to last forever, bless God. But not in a sinful state and a sinful environment. Turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis Chapter 3, the mic sounds good, but I should have had this mic during the campaign. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, reading verse 22. Genesis chapter 3, but reading verse 22. And those who don't know their Bible as well as they would like to, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. We're talking from chapter 3, but verse 22 in the Bible says, Are you there? If you are there, let me hear you say amen. And the Lord God said, who said? Lord. The Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. It wasn't in God's plan for our brains to be able to have to deal with the issue of dissecting what is good. What is evil? So before he says this statement, 
Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15 comes to us like this. And it was important that God had to do this for us. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. Shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise is healed. Since we got exposed to sin, God had to do something to help our brains to be able to deal with the issue of sin. So God had to put enmity within our brain. And let me tell you something, enmity is a gift Amen. from the living God. And without this enmity, every single one of us will be lost. Okay, listen. The book of Great Controversy, page 506, comes to us like this. It is the grace that Christ implants in the soul which creates in man enmity against Satan. Without this converting grace and renewing power, man would continue the captive of Satan. What? If God never said in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to put enmity, we would ever be the servants of Satan. Listen. A servant ever ready to do his bidding. But the new principle in the soul it creates conflict. Where hitherto there was peace. The power which Christ imparts. So he doesn't give it to you all at once. He gives it to you in parts. Enables man to resist the tyrant and the usurper. Whoever is seen to have all sin instead of loving it. Whoever resists and conquers those passions that have held sway within displays the operation of a principle that is holy from above. Amen. Amen. My brothers and my sisters read a book the other day I do a lot of reading because I have the time to read. It's a book called Conscience, Your Inner Voice by Thomas A. Davis. He outlines a few things in this book which I want to lay as a foundation for our discussion today. He says, first, the, 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 the conscience is a variable organ. That means it can be adapted and it can change. Sometimes it might speak to you in a small little voice, but sometimes it might shout at you. Second, the word conscience is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. In the New, it's mentioned 32 times. And, it's, and, and, and the Greek word is suidasis which means a co-perceptioner. So technically, your conscience helps you to see evil when it's coming. Yeah. Third, the conscience is, refer is referred to as a sensor, a voice, an eye, but also a judge. So when you do it wrong, it would make you feel uncomfortable. Listen. He explains that conscience is different from instinct. You see, instinct prompts us to follow inclinations and impulses, and those things can be followed blindly. But conscience follows reason. That means there's a set of rules which have a cause to effect, and conscience follows reason. And not 
blind emotions. That one we're going to come back to. Five, he says, conscience is that voice between the thought and the act. So there's a thought that says, you know what? I'm going to watch that program. But in between the thinking it and doing it, conscience steps in and says, you know what? You better not do it. Six, he asks the question, world and man without conscience, how would it be like? <laughs> He's saying, imagine we had a world which did not have a conscience. In other words, living in a world without God's grace, living in the world without enmity, or living in the world without God having a kid. He, he brings it home as saying, imagine you having traffic lights in a jungle amongst cannibals. The traffic light says red, but the cannibal don't even understand what red means. Stop. He also delineates that Satan does not have a conscience. It died thousands of years ago. And Satan is working to get mankind to that point. And you know what, brothers and sisters? We go get there. By grace, we are not going to get there. Eight, conscience is our judge or witness, but it is not the law. What do you mean, sir? Our consciences need to be educated and taught by God's holy word. Amen. So the conscience does not have an inbuilt law in it. It needs to be educated. Amen. So he says in, uh, in 9, in nine, the ninth issue he brings home is that man's first duty is not to follow his conscience. Because there's a lot of men who's done wickedness and they said they follow their conscience. The first duty of mankind is to educate and enlighten their conscience. And our consciences need updating all the time. And he says, 11. No, he says, in, in 10. Consciences hate grace. Oh, you're going to understand why I went through these 12 points in a minute. But conscience it hates gray. He wants either black or he wants either white. He does not like the middle road. Amen. And he says, 11. <laughs> Our consciences need to have its own pole star. Pole star, P-O-L-E-S-T-A-R. I looked up that word. That means that a navigational point, it needs to be directed by something. It cannot direct itself because as we know, consciences can misfire and misdirect. So a conscience needs a pole star. It needs something that it believes is its standard. And they say the pole star of the conscience must be the word of the living God. Amen. But he also ends the book by saying every time we violate conscience and this voice of warning we are making ourselves vulnerable to the manipulation of demons. You see, self is the enemy of conscience. When conscience tells you to go that way, but you make up your mind saying, you know, that way is too rough. I'm going to go that way. She says that we, he says that we are opening up ourselves to demand. 
demonic oppression on every level. All right. What am I saying all of this? Is it just to give a lovely message on how wonderful the brain is? No. No. It is in our cerebrum where the frontal lobe is. It is where the frontal lobe is, is where our conscience is. And it is our conscience where the seat of the Holy Spirit is. Amen. Listen. It is our conscience that the Holy Ghost uses to communicate to us. So when we read and study the word of the living God, then the Holy Ghost can use the word of God and educate and control our consciences so everything that we do is under the power Amen. of the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 30 is one of the most famous texts. Isaiah chapter 30, write it down and check me out. And we need to understand this text, Isaiah chapter 30, but reading verse 21, come on and turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 30, reading verse 21, my brothers and my sisters. Isaiah chapter 30, reading verse 21, and the Bible says, and thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk, be in it when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. In other words, conscience will always guide you and direct you right if you follow him and if he is under the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes, sir. First Corinthians chapter 8 tells us something what we need to take on board, my brothers and sisters. And don't cut my throat this morning, but 1 Corinthians 8, verse 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, reading verse 12 to 13. And this is something that every one of us should take on board. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but reading verse 12 to 13. I'm just going to read it quick because I want to stay alive by the end of Sabbath. And the Bible says, but when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So what is he trying to explain? He's trying to say that when you sin against the brethren, by, by doing what? And wound their weak conscience, you sin against who? Okay, what is he talking about? The next verse, and it says it in verse, thir in verse 13. Wherefore, if me make my brethren brother to what? A thing. I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to a friend. Yeah. Listen, we are our brother's keeper on a level where many of us don't even understand. If I do something and it makes my brother become weak, then I haven't just sinned against my brethren, I've sinned against the living God. In other words, saying that meaning this, you better be careful how you act around the brethren and the people in the world because you could discourage them from giving their hearts to the living God. Let that one soak in for a bit. Amen. Titus 1, 15 to 16. Titus chapter 1 is talking about conscience. Titus 1, 15 to 16. Book of Titus, just before the book of Hebrews. Titus 1, 15 to 16. And the Bible says, just before the book of Hebrews. Titus chapter 1, but verse 15 to 16. Verse 15. Now unto the pure, <laughs> all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is what, church? Defiled. Defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny Him. Being abominable and what, church? Yes. Disobedient. And unto every good work, reprobate. 
So in other words, there's a group of people who say they live for the living God. But their actions, they say another thing. So we gotta take care of how we deal with our brothers and sisters. If you dress a certain way, you will weak at your brother, you sin against the living God. If you eat a certain way, you will weak at your brother, you sin against the living God. Reprobate. That word reprobate comes from a deep wording which means void of judgment or morally unprincipled. Oh, I'm going to come to where I want to come to with this thing called conscience. This whole world has near enough been filled up with reprobates. Because the majority of the world do not fear the living God. Oh, I want to get even whole, closer home than that. Many people who call themselves God-fearing Christians, they have become bordering on the side of reprobates. Because they believe coming to church is Christianity. Demons come to church. So we're going to do more than go to church. We need to live for the living God. An apostle Paul comes to tell us like this, if we carry on thinking that we can just live anyhow and any way, our conscience can get to a point where it becomes so damaged it will never ever get back to how God originally wanted it to be with the Holy Ghost. Are you sure? Yes! First Timothy chapter 4, but reading verse 12, write it out and check me out yourself. First Timothy chapter 4, but reading verse 12. Look with me, my brothers and my sisters. First Timothy chapter 4. But reading verse 1 and 2 rather. First Timothy chapter 4, reading verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Who speaks expressly? Amen. The sweet Spirit of the living God.
Thank you.